Good morning, good morning. You said? You said? My name is Ikogo Simon. Yes, yes, yes. Good morning, good morning. My, my, name, my name is Shewaki Elu. I'll be, I'll be leading this conversation for, for the next one hour. Um, I know we are supposed to have a lot of people in here. It's about 11 o'clock. We are supposed to start for 11, and we would like to keep to our words. So I want to believe every other person will join us. But while waiting for some other people that would want to just rush in, even as we start, I'd like us to just introduce ourselves. Um, I just want to get two people to introduce themselves, your name, um, your designation, and your company, and what you want to learn from this class. Just two, three people, and, and we can now proceed. Uh, my name is Shimaki. Like I said, I represent GODP um, in this class. So can we just kick it off? Your name, your designation, your company, and what you want to learn from this class. Please, you can start. Anybody can kick it off. Good morning, sir. Good morning, sir. My name is Carol Yabijemi, Senior Manager at J.K. Randu Professional Services. Ben, external auditor to most of the financial institutions. I want to learn more about the social requirements with respect to basic capital adequacy for now. Beautiful. Thank you very much. OK. Next, any other person? So next, please, any other person, you can introduce yourself and tell us what you want to learn. Well, well good morning, everyone. Um, like I said earlier, uh, my name is um, Simon Nikogo. I work for Right Group Microfinance Bank. Um, I'm in investor relations. For me, um, of course, you know what that means. So. I want to get, get to know more about capital adequacy and how that would help us in the long run. Thank you. Thank you. So one more person, then we can start the business of the day. Your name and your designation and what you want to learn. Just one more person. One more person. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Yeah, you know, my name is Neil Kundikwe. Um, from Orange One Finance. So, um, I want to actually learn about the uh, basis, basic requirements for basic capital adequacy, um, especially to put to rest all this contradiction between um, CBN examiners when they come around and what we have in our books. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so let's just kick it off immediately. Thank you very much for all the introduction. And um, this is a very complex class, um, um, an intro class and any questions you have at any point in time. However, it's very practical. So I'll be using real life scenarios. I'll be doing um, things with different templates that you don't need to stress yourself any longer. Just put some figures in and you can get your figures out. So it's, I'm, not, I'm not a lecturer in the university. I'm actually, it's more of a very practical class. So let's, let's start the whole journey with, with the journey of, of um, the bank, the banking um, uh, Basel Committee for Bank Supervision. Um, this guys actually came up and it at least started with 10, 10 central banks of, of the G10 countries. Um, that one I want to believe we actually know. So they came together for a particular reason. The reason was very simple. How do we ensure that our financial institution have sufficient capital to run the business? How do they have sufficient capital, adequate capital to run the business? That was the main reason. And that was because um, uh, Financial institutions at points in time, they are all, they, they, the risk around the business is actually more than probably many other industries that you probably can find. So these guys came together and they actually formed, um, they started this really um, sometimes in 1974. So they came together in 1974 and they actually formed all of this. They issued the first set of standards in, in, in 1988. And after that, they've continued upgrading and making things better even as the risk begin to change, as the risk begin to evolve, 
as the risk becomes more dynamic. So you will discover that major updates were actually carried out in 1991 with things around definition of the provision of risk. Hello? Please, can you hear us? Yes, yes, yes. Loud and clear. Okay, wonderful. Because I can hear somebody saying I can't hear. Okay, so 1996, they incorporated a lot of things too around market risk, where you now have your um, uh, market risk um, with, with a charge or risk quoted asset calculated in a particular way um, using value at risk. Subsequently, they introduced a lot of things around specific risk, general risk, vertical disallowance, horizontal disallowance. We'll be looking at some of them even as we go on, on this. In 2004, they came up also with the one that you call Basel II, and where that actually has three major pillars. One is the minimum capital requirement, the supervisory review, and also the discipline around the disclosures. Subsequently, after that, they've issued and continued issuing. But what I'm actually going to talk about here is the most updated Basel Accord that we are supposed to use. So effectively, it brings together all the updates. It brings together all of the research and all of the publications that they have put out there for us to actually use. So the whole essence of the Basel Accord, like I said, is to ensure that we actually have a set of regulations to determine how much capital financial institutions should have to ensure that they guide against risk, whether it's market risk or credit risk, whether it is operational risk, how much capital do we need to hold to ensure that we guide against any risk crystallizing? That is what it is all about. So you actually have this broken down into these pillars under Basel II. But the sincere truth is that beyond Basel II, there have been other issues around the um, uh, leverage cover ratio, other issues around liquidity. They've actually issued other issues around things like the, like I said, the liquidity cover, like the leverage ratio, like the capital conversion buffer. They've actually issued many of those more recently. So we'll be looking at that in the full class. Okay, taking it a step further, I'm actually gonna to talk today majorly about minimum capital requirement as an intro. How do we determine then how much capital is enough to run the business? The sincere truth is that we are in the business of risk, i.e. I collect money from some people and they are credit risk. Credit risk divided into two effectively, whether it's default risk, the risk that they will not pay when they should pay, or concentration risk, the risk that because I'm actually giving more loans to people in the Northeast. So because of the risk that of, of, of different things going on, we might not be able to get our money back. Or is it market risk, the risk that the interest rate is actually falling, especially in the government securities and even the whole economy? What about operational risk? The risk that, oh, there are many issues in the economy as a result of that, the operational risk that the bank might not be able to perform effectively. All this risk together is what determines how much we need to do more in terms of getting enough capital to run the business. So the question is, do we have enough capital? What is that capital that is minimum that we should have to ensure that we are running correctly? Now. To look at that, Basel has broken this down into three tiers. Or let me see, yeah, three tiers, tier one, additional tier one, and tier two. So if you look at it, it is actually two tiers. But I'm actually gonna be explaining them one by one. So what we have in tier one capital, and there's also an hypothetical tier three capital. Okay, so, so I need us to actually mute um, uh, uh, so that basically uh, we don't, yeah. So there's an hypothetical tier three. Hypothetical tier three effectively is the depositors money. But you see, tier one, tier two capital is what you use to run the business. Tier three capital is not your capital. It is the other depositors money, which is hypothetical. So we only have tier one, additional tier one capital and tier two capital. So let's talk about, so effectively total regulatory capital is equals to tier one capital, additional tier one capital and tier two capital. That's what our regulatory capital is. So let's talk about each of this. Let's talk about first the tier one capital. What falls into tier one capital? 
Before I begin to talk about what falls into tier one capital, no, yeah, let's even talk about what falls into tier one capital. Tier one capital basically is made up of the common shares, share premium, share premium on the common shares, the retained earnings, your reserves, and any regulatory adjustments that we'll be talking about subsequently after now. But the question will now be, if you look at it really, the large chunk of what you have there is the common shares, the share premium on the co common shares, the retained earnings and your reserves, apart from the revaluation reserve on PP&E. I'm talking about reserve now. Apart from the revaluation reserve on PP&E. Now, all this is what we actually have in tier one. But the question is, how do I know what will be the constituent of common shares? Now, you know, when we look at the regulations from CBN, they are most likely like um, a list. However, the sincere truth is that all those regulations are actually from the Basel Accord. So today I'll be putting light into, how do you determine, putting light into um, gray areas around this, rather than just telling you what CBN requirement says. So let's talk about how do I determine what should be part of the common shares issued by the bank? How do I know that it is common shares? Because some common shares, if you look at the characteristic very well, you might discover that the name is common shares, but it's actually a tier two capital. So how do I determine is a tier one capital and it's common shares? One, all of the all of the people that are buying into this are only entitled to residual income of the company. Two, it is actually there's no there's no maturity date. Effectively, they can come back and say, I want to collect my money back. Three, residual income is their own. Four, no buyback loss, meaning we have not told them we will buy back in six months. So in a situation where you actually have some common shares that within the agreement of issuing the shares, the company have already told them that we will buy back the shares in two years. It is no longer a tier one capital. Though the name might be called common shares. So it, there's no buyback loss or there's no redemp redemption period. And distribution of dividends is actually non-obligatory, -oblig meaning that it is only when there's residual income we can give you from it. Also, these shares are all called equity in the financial statement. And they are all agreed. The owners of the business agreed that you should issue it with also regulate all regulators. They agreed that you should actually go ahead and issue it. When all these parameters are there, we say it is common shares issued by the bank on that year one. Now, the share premium on this share issue is also part of the tier one capital. That is what is inside tier one capital. So like I said, tier one capital includes common shares issued by the bank that complies with the tier one capital requirements, the share premium on the common shares, the retained earnings, the reserves, and regulatory reserves that we'll be talking about when we actually go on today. So what is inside additional tier one capital? Like I said, regulatory capital is equals to tier one capital plus additional tier one capital plus tier two capital. So what is inside tier one additional tier one capital? Now, there's a difference really a little bit. There's one little difference in there. But what is inside the additional tier one capital Include one, all of those instruments issued by the bank that meet the requirements or the criteria of the additional tier one capital, which we'll look at immediately. And then the share premium on that, then the regulatory reserves that we'll be talking about afterwards around this. So let us look at some major criteria that fits in, that makes us say it is additional tier one capital. One, it is issued and fully paid. Two, it may be callable by the issuer, but you see, they cannot call it back in anything between zero and five years. It has to be after five years. So for it to be a tier two capital, we can say that we can call it back and say, come and take your money, come and take your principal. Remember for tier, tier one capital, you cannot even call it back at all. But for additional tier one capital, you can actually call it back 
minimum five year requirement, meaning that you can only call it back after five years. Three, dividend is actually discretional. I.e., you can't say that I'm going to collect X or Y amount. Dividend is discretional and based on the issuer. Four, it is perpetual, no maturity date. Meaning that it is not like you say, okay, oh, it will expire or it will mature in 10 years. No maturity date, but the issuer can call it back. No credit sensitive dividend features in there too. All of this brings together what we actually have inside the additional tier one capital. So if you begin to think about it, when you actually have an issue for which you have now said in seven years, we, are, we, can, we actually have the right to call it back and give you your money back, then this might be a tier two, tier one, additional tier one capital. Not effectively a tier one capital, but additional tier one capital. All this is what, so let, let, to actually buttress my point, I'm going to ask this, you tell me whether it's in or out. So I have an instrument. Issued instrument is mandatorily convertible to ordinary shares at predetermined dates with no maturity dates before conversion. Is this a tier one capital, additional tier one capital, or I don't know? Please, I want somebody to tell me, is this additional tier one capital or not? Please, you can just unmute to answer my question. Additional. Please go ahead. Additional. It's additional. Tier one. Why, why did you say it's additional? Why? You know, you have to give your answer with reason. Okay, um, like, like, like we said, I, I do not say one, it can be, it can be callable after a while, after um, the minimum of, of, of seven years. Now, number two, number two point is that um, it, it, it fits into, um, it can be converted to um, equity and Based on that, it becomes um, a, an additional uh, tier one. Okay. Okay. Is that, okay. Is that, yeah, does my anybody name is want to add any other thing? Please go ahead, please. Yeah, yeah my name is Shola. Uh, I think the information is not complete. Uh, the yes. No, just use the information you have here, Loon. Assume every other one. That's why I said yeah, you okay, should explain. So <laughs> the pre date, the predetermined date is not stated. So what about if the predetermined date is lower than five years? Correct. And then it doesn't fall into additional tier one. Correct. So that is actually the any other person. So the most important thing with this is you now begin to ask yourself, is the predetermined date before or after five years? That's what you want to ask yourself. Then in addition to that, if you look at it, it is mandatorily convertible to ordinary shares, meaning it is looking more like ordinary shares because it's mandatory at a predetermined date. And no maturity date before the conversion, meaning that you cannot call it away before the conversion date. So if you look at this information very well, I will go with the first two. It is additional tier one. It is actually additional tier one. So let's look at the second one. Issued instrument is mandatorily convertible to ordinary shares at a predetermined date. It includes call option applicable at any time before the conversion date. Is this additional tier one? Um, my name is Wally Polano. It is not. Mm, why, sir? Because uh, we, we are talking about the time, the time which uh, you could you could qualify as a general tier one. So if it's not up to if the that any time, it's not it's not beyond yeah. five years. It's not it is not because they've already given us. They said it is callable at any time before the conversion. Any time before that means the second day can say I don't want the good. Uh, we want to call it back. Yeah, so thank you very much. Any other co any other comments before I move on to the next one? Any comments? Okay, I go to the next one. Instrument C. Issued instrument is callable after five years of initiation. It is callable quarterly at every interest rate due date. Is this a additional tier one capital or not? Please, did you get my question? Yes, we, we got it. We got it. I, I think uh, it, it could. It could be additional, additional, additional tier one capital. 
because the, 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 the first condition mm. Mm. is specific that is after five years that you, of initiation. So thereafter, it might be at every um, interest payment they do. That means whatever it is, it won't recall on to five years. That's the best time. So they to come back. Thank it's you very much. It's any other part of the chair. I'll try to work after. Okay, beautiful. Thank you very much. Any other any other thoughts? Any other thoughts on okay. this? Uh, my, my name is Shola. Please go I, I think it's not additional because uh, this is interest payment as against dividend. Mm. So I don't think it falls under. Tier one additional or tier one? Correct. Okay, I, I'm listening. My, when I say correct, it doesn't mean it, it's hundred percent correct or not. I'm not correct. It's just a, yeah. Any other thoughts before I say anything about it? <laughs> any other thoughts, please? I've not heard some people talk, so I might be looking for you, uh, Peter Ola Tundu. I've not heard you say anything. I want to just hear your voice, really. Utaka manager. I'm sorry, it's the name I see on this thing. I'm calling uh, Thomas. Ali, Ali Gaita. I just want to hear people talk really. Any other thoughts? Is there additional tier one or not? Somebody said yes, it is. Somebody said no, it is not. So I need a democracy here. More people queuing behind. Simon, Simon Ikogo, Pius Arome. Please, can you just help me out? Is this three, instrument three, um, is it additional tier one or not? Okay. Good morning, everyone. My name is Pius. Okay, in my view, uh, it's not additional tier, tier one capital because of the interest mentioned there, really. So I'm going with your last view. Okay, 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 okay. Okay, so number one. Let's look at the said instrument is callable after five years of initiation. That means if it is callable after five years of initiation, then we can say that, oh, it is looking more like a tier one capital, uh, sorry, additional tier one capital. Then we now said it is callable quarterly. Now this quarterly year that I put here is quarterly after the five years period, meaning that it is callable quarterly after the five year period. Now they now said at every interest payment date, now, remember that even if they call an instrument, if you say it is interest, what determines whether it is interest is not the name they call it, it's what the interest is. Remember, I have already explained in the slides before. I said for it to be additional tier one, any repayment, any of the repayment that you actually have there, it must be no credit sensitive dividend, so it will have no credit sensitive dividend features. Okay. Meaning it must be no credit sensitive. So if that thing that they call interest payments is no is not credit, credit sensitive, it is a, an additional tier one capital. If it is however credit sensitive, that is when it will not be additional tier one. Please, do you understand what I just said? Uh, sir, can you let that, what, what is credit sensitive interest? Okay, so what is credit? So let us look at it. For example, if I actually want to look at, I want to give loan to Dan Gote, and I want to give loan to Mr. A that nobody knows. So determine the interest rate I want to give that loan at. In most cases, I will look at the credit worthiness of the obligos or the proposed obligos. Now, for Dangote, probably I will say in my mind, this guy has plenty of money. Hence, the credit worthiness is high. Hence, the credit risk is low. Now, what am I using to factor that in? The risk, the credit risk, we could either be expected risk of default or expected risk of concentration. If the repayments that are involved here does not have anything tied to the credit worthiness or the expected credit risk, then it is still an additional tier one. Please, do you understand what I just said? So I don't think it's not too clear. Okay. So I will, I will try to just bring some little, so basically when you're actually charging interest rates, so if I actually have 
No, they call, called it interest payment. But what I'm trying to explain to you is that interest payment, they could have called it interest payment, but we are paying you five naira. Whether we, whether we make one billion or 10 billion, we will pay you five naira every, every month. Now, if that five naira we are paying you does not have anything to do with the credit risk involved in the business, it is not credit sensitive. For example, the amount of money that we pay to people as dividend has nothing to do with, it is only when we have shared all the money and the money remaining is the residual income. That residual income will pay you from it. If the same thing applies here, where we will only pay you that thing we call interest payment if we have money. Like I said, bank must have full discretion to cancel distribution. You see, if the distribution of what I call interest rate here, we can only pay you if the bank has made enough money after paying every other person, then it will be an additional tier one capital. What I'm trying to explain to you is that the mere fact that it is called interest eh, in an agreement, does not mean it is interest by meaning. It could be that it is distributable income, but in the contract you are seeing, they call the name of that distributable income interest. Please, do you understand okay. my English? So, so why, why, so for instance, why use a conflicting or a controversial word as it were, if a simpler word can be used? I'm just saying. You are correct. That's the essence of this discussion because the different agreements you will see, you might find different names. What matters is the substance of the transaction, not the legal form. Do you understand what I just said? So it is not really the name used. You could call something capital and the, the characteristic of that capital is that it is the liability. You could call something a preference share, but the characteristic of that preference share is that it is equity. So what matters is the substance of that particular thing. Please, do you understand me? Yes, sir. Okay, so that is what I want. I don't want you to just be fixated on interest. The moment they call it interest in an agreement, you say it's interest. It might not be interest. Yeah, and that is what I'm discussing beyond the names that you see here. Any questions on that before I move on? Uh, excuse me, just that, um, can, I think that could be many practical examples. Yes, okay. oh, so, you, will get, you will get okay. many. You will get okay. many as you actually Okay, thank you. You will get okay, many. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay. So what do I now put inside the tier two capital in all of this? What do I drop inside the tier two capital? Because I have talked about tier one capital, common shares, retain earnings, share premium on common shares, all of those ones, tier additional tier one. Now let us talk about tier two. So tier two will be all of those things that meet the requirements of tier two. And the share premium of those instruments that are issued by the company that meets the, on those things that, are, that meet the requirements of tier two, loan loss provisioning, and also the regulatory reserve that I said I'm going to talk about afterwards. So what are the requirements of that inclusion as tier two? Number one, we were the ones that issued it and we collected our money, meaning it is issued and it is paid in. Number two, it is not secured or guaranteed. See, the moment it is secured or guaranteed, it is not capital. It is not a tier two capital. It is a liability. We are saying that if anything, anything happens, we will pay you back. So tier two, not guaranteed, as also it applies to every other one. But the minimum original, original maturity is this one. It could actually have a maturity. And the original maturity must be five years and above. But it is not guaranteed. Meaning, if we will pay you anything, whether we'll be able to pay you or not, it's not guaranteed. It may, it may be callable to the same way we actually spoke about additional tier one. It may be callable by the issuer and say that we actually want our money back. And just the same way, the instrument cannot have any credit sensitive dividend feature. Because in all sincerity, there are instruments that have credit sensitive dividend feature. You might not look at them because they call them dividends. You will say it's dividend, but they might be credit sensitive. So don't always just look at the fact that they call it dividends. It means it's equity. 
It might not be. That's where I'm trying to go. So all of these things is what we actually have in the tier two capital. Now, to bring it home, things like your normal paid in capital is tier one. Things like your retained earnings is tier two. That's all tier one. Share premium tier one. Fair value through OCI reserve tier one. Derivative held as cash held uh, reserve tier one. Foreign exchange reserve tier one. Um, foreign exchange uh, regulatory reserve tier one. Capital reserve tier one. But when we now come to things like evaluation of PPE uh, reserve, evaluation reserve on PPE tier two, subordinated debt tier two, impairment provision tier two, and on and on, preference shares tier two. So this actually brings it to summary. Now, I've not spoken about the regulatory adjustment, but those regulatory adjustments will now be on each of them, whether tier one, additional tier one, or tier two. Now, to bring this home, like I said, there are a lot of uh, um, um, examples for us to look at. So tell me which one should be in tier one and which one should be in tier two. Ordinary share capital, tier one or tier two? Tier one. Share premium on ordinary shares, tier one, tier two. Tier one. Statutory reserve, tier one, tier two. Tier one. <laughs> no, that tier one did not reach ground oh. very well. <laughs> is it tier one or tier two? Tier two. Statutory is a stat, statutory is tier one. Oh no, you see now, you are telling there are different people are saying this. Okay, tell me whether another person please tell me. Tell, I have here one tier one, one tier two. So statutory reserve, where should I put it? Tier one. Tier, is that really tier one, please? Let's go. Capital reserve, tier one or tier two? Capital reserve. Yes. Uh, uh, tier one. Tier one. Any other person? It should be tier one. Tier one. Yeah, um, tier I need, one. I need tier two. Anybody that believes it's tier two? Tier one. Tier one. Okay, since it's, uh, we are using democracy, it's tier one. However, it's tier one. If I know, Evaluation result tier one or tier two? Tier two. Tier two. Other result tier one or tier two? Tier two. Tier uh, one. No. Tier, tier one two. Tier two. Okay. Okay. So other result is actually tier one. Tier um, one. Yes, sir. Subordinated debt tier one or tier two? Tier two. Tier two. Impairment provision on lo lo uh, uh, loans tier one or tier two? Yeah. Tier two. Tier two. Investment reserve, tier one or tier two? Tier two. It's tier one. <laughs> yeah. So thank you very much. I want to believe with this, you actually understand. So tier one, tier two, um, I want to believe you. I, I'll also put a summary here for you to actually just- Hello, sir. Please Hello, sir. Hello. Please go ahead. Hello. Go ahead. We can hear you. Hello. Good morning, well done, sir. Good morning, sir. We can hear you. Please go ahead. Yeah, my name is Sonifa Dadeleke. Yes. What of the venture? What of the venture? Is it tier one or the venture? Okay. So the characteristics of the debenture, like I said, yeah. is not, eh, so the, yeah. with the characteristics of a normal debenture, the question yes, is that is it guaranteed or not guaranteed? Is this secured or not secured? Secu uh, we have different types of debenture. Eh, so that is the reason why I'm asking this. If it is it's a secure debenture, it is okay. not even a cap. It is not within tier one or tier two. It's a liability. Okay. Yes. So because okay. remember, it is these requirements that we are criteria that we are using to uh, use them. You no know, CBN just gave us a framework. They did the. They just put list and gave us. But it's a function of whether it is guaranteed or not, or secured or not. So if it is okay. not secured, you just put it inside tier two. All of all of share capital, sir. I have put it on there. I said it's tier two. It's here, number 16. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Oh, okay. okay. So, so let's, let's take it a step further because, um, so let's talk about the regulatory adjustments. Now, why are we even doing all of these adjustments? Well, these are the, and you need to back them out. Things like goodwill, intangible assets, um, net assets on your defined benefit obligation, deferred tax assets, that you believe that the company will actually, re, no, that you will reverse when the company is actually making profits. Profit. All of those things, you will back it out. Uh, Mr. Abel, you are helping me to draw this uh, red light. So, so basically, all of this needs to be backed out. So let me show you a simple template 
that, that we are, we actually have many of these templates for, okay, so for normal regulatory capital, normal regulatory capital, I think I have a template for, so that actually summarizes everything. So if I go to this regulatory capital, this actually shows me all the regulatory capital, but this one is also used for stress testing really. So this actually shows me all the items, whether it's tier one or tier two, so that you don't miss it out and you just put in your figures and you just move on. So that is actually what it is. That is what your tier one and tier two. So if I can actually just put this, like I said to somebody that asked me a question some minutes ago, I said there are many examples. Okay, so I think we need to mute when we want to. Okay, All so right, thank you. Okay, so let's take it a step further. I actually have this simple example. So tell me, in this financial statement, what is tier one capital? Please, can you see my screen very well? Yeah. So in this example, for 31 December 20, 2018, what is tier one capital? What is tier two capital? And what is the regulatory capital? Please, can you just take one minute to just do this? Just, yeah. What's tier one capital? What's tier two capital? Share capital and share premium. Share capital and share premium, tier one. Well, okay. Preference share, tier two. Tier two. Reserves, tier one. Tier one. Retain, Retain any tier, tier one. Tier one. Okay. So, so regulatory capital is how much? Regulatory capital is three. They are put it there now. So all of them together is the regulatory capital. Am I correct? Yeah. Okay, so let me just proceed to the next one. So now that we have talked a little bit about regulatory capital, now this is supposed to be a one hour compressed class, really, but I will try to just let's talk about the risk weighted assets. Now, the whole idea around giving us a requirement, and this is where the real work is. The work is not inside that regulatory capital. The real work is inside this risk quoted asset. So I, I think I've actually done this for many, many, uh, sorry, a lot of financial institutions coming forward to say, oh, how do we have to, especially for stress testing, ICAP, and we begin to look at it with them. The sincere truth is, this is where the real work is. So why? What is the essence of all of this risk quoted asset? The idea is that the asset we are investing money, hypothetical tier one, tier two, tier three capital. That liability and equity, inside what assets are we investing them? And what is the variability of the risk within that asset? If the risk of the asset we are investing them is high, then that means that we need more capital to run the business. For example, if I collect 10 million from the shareholders and I collected depositors' money, 50 million, and I went to go and use that money, I invested it in um, loan, unguaranteed and unsecured loan, you will discover that there's every probability that you will need more money to run that business. So the risk weighted asset basically shows us how risky your assets are. So what you want to ensure is that ensure that your risk weighted asset is small. That is, the, that is where you are, what you want to achieve. The risk weighted asset is small after you have calculated it. Now, so the Basel Accord actually brings, it even helps us to look at the risk weighted asset and even the capital adequacy ratio from different perspectives. Now, from the CPN perspective, they only require us effectively to calculate the total capital adequacy ratio. That is what the major guideline is, where they tell us that, oh, for the internationally uh, international uh, uh, authorized ones, um, uh, go ahead and do 15%. For the local and regional and national, go ahead and do 10%. But the sincere truth is that from the Basel Accord, they give us more leeway to say, do common, do tier one divided by the total risk quoted asset. The assumption is that when you are doing tier one, using the Basel framework, it says if I'm doing tier one as a percentage of risk quoted asset, we must ensure that we have greater than or equals to 
4.5%. Now, if we are going to achieve that, that means that what we have as the risk weighted asset must be smaller. And they went on to say, if we are doing total tier one rather than common equity alone that I just talked about, if we are doing total tier one, it must be greater than or equal to 6%. And if you are doing the total capital adequacy ratio, which looks at the total regulatory capital divided by the risk quoted asset, we must do greater than or equal to 8%. However, there is now regulation, regional regulation. I'm talking about Nigeria now, for example. In Nigeria, as is now to say, banks with international authorization, you are expected to do greater than 50%, 15% or greater. Local banks, regional banks, national banks, microfinance banks, 10% and above. Banks with designated systemic uh, uh, domestic, uh, sorry, systemic importance, you do 16%. The question is, how do I know institutions that are systemically important. The way Basel looks at it, systemically important banks are those ones, or financial institutions, are those ones that they must not fail. I.e., their import, if they fail, is very, very high. And how do they determine that import that I'm talking about? How do they determine that import of them failing. They determine it by looking at one, the size. Two, the interconnectedness. Three, how easy it is to substitute them. Four, how complex they are. What do I mean? So if you actually have a bank or a financial institution that is big, two, their connection, their, their interconnectedness with other financial institutions is very high that if they leave the balance, there will be a problem. Three, how easy is it to substitute them? For example, if you take one of the bigger banks in Nigeria and you kill it, how easy is it to get another bank to substitute them? If it is not very easy, that means that they will have a high substitutability ratio. Four, the complexity. When we are talking about complexity, we look at the how easy and how complex their structure is. For example, and in Nigeria, from the CBN, what they look at modularly is the number of branch network and international subsidiaries. So if they say we want to close Bank ABC in Nigeria, how complex is it to close it? If Bank ABC has subsidiary in 30 countries, the complexities of closing such a bank will now mean that they need to close all of the other subsidiaries or all of the other branches. So when they are looking at whether a bank is designated systemically important, they look at one, size, two, interconnectedness, three, substitutability, uh, four, the complexity to determine if they are or not. So for such banks, they do 16% or higher. Now that is the way CBN has looked at each of this. Let's now talk a little bit about how you calculate this thing. Now, in this, I have put this here. I said, to calculate the risk quoted asset, first you need to calculate the credit risk quoted asset, then the market risk quoted asset, then, then the operational risk quoted asset. So if you look at risk quoted asset that is used, in calculating capital adequacy, it factors in all the risk that the bank will be exposed to. So let's talk about how you calculate the credit risk quoted asset. Okay, let me confirm that I'm not talking to myself. Please confirm to me that I'm not talking to myself. I just need somebody to say, I confirm. I confirm. Okay. Yeah, with you. I, 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 do, I, I do confirm too. Okay, wonderful. So how do you calculate the credit risk quoted asset? I confirm. Wonderful. Thank you. So how do we calculate the credit risk? There are two approaches to calculating the credit risk quoted assets. We have the standard approach and the IRB, internal risk-based approach, sincerely. At this point, I'm now going to be a little bit more technical. I've been speaking English, I'll speak mathematics more now. Now, the standard approach is basically using some standards that have been set out 
by the Basel framework. So they have given us different kinds of exposures with different kinds of risk weights in such a way that if I have such instruments, I can just take the risk weight and multiply it with the exposure I have, and it will tell me the value of the risk weighted asset. Remember, like I explained before, the idea is that always have zero or very, very small risk weighted assets. Meaning that if this thing that we apply will give us high risk weighted asset, that means that there's a problem with the with the with your portfolio. <laughs> yeah. And when we are using this, is all it is also remember for each of the risk weighted uh, uh, risk weights that Bastel is giving to us, it is linked to scores, risk scores, or risk, yeah, risk scores. Those risk scores, they are from credit agencies. Those risk scores, they are from credit agencies. So there are many credit agencies, Standards and Poor, um, Augustus. Um, there are many of them, you know them, Moody's. You use many of them already. Now, all of this, we now need to begin to tie them to the credit risk rating. And some of these guidelines you begin to get from our national um, national regulators like CBN. So this standard approach it looks at it from that perspective. So, for example, this this particular thing I'm showing you now is the risk weight from Basel. So the idea is that if it is a sovereign exposure or investment in T bills, investment in FGM bond, investment in FMDO FMDO bonds. All of those ones are sovereign exposures. Those sovereign exposures, if the risk rating is AAA to AA minus, it is 0%. But the moment that the risk rating is dropping from to A plus to A minus, BB plus to B minus, you will discover that the risk weight that is assigned by Basel also begins to increase. Meaning the higher the risk, the higher the risk weight. So this is the particular table that shows us what Basel is saying. So if you look at it, it is the exposure versus the weight or versus the risk rating or risk assessment from those risk agencies. Now, to put this for you, I actually have a tool that, I, that, um, that we actually have in our firm that uh, we actually have many tools with it. Let me just go to the one for credit risk weighting for standards. So for example, please, can you see my screen? So for example, if I have an instrument and I say it is FGM bond, FGM bond five. Yeah? And as of that year, what we have is 100 something. I'm just typing something. I just come here and I click on the type of exposure. Is it corporate? Is it past due? Is it all of the exposures that Basel is in the Basel Accord? I just click on any one of them. And I come here and I also come and select the rating. And this will actually tell us the risk weights. It will tell us the risk weighted asset that you actually charge on that. So as I change this, it will also change what I should have and tell me. So if I change it to this, now, it's telling me that the risk weighted asset because of this is zero on this particular one. Now, this particular template actually incorporates the guideline of Basel in such a way that I just click on it and it gives me the figure. But the guideline is what I just showed you here. Effectively, for each of the risk, they look at one, who the exposure is to, two, the risk weight or the risk rates from the agencies or the credit agencies for that particular instrument. And also remember, if you don't know what it is, just come here and click on, and just tell us that it is uh, not, not rated and just move on. Just tell us that it is other asset and tell us that it's not rated and move on. Yeah, you can tell us from there because also it tells us that standard weight for all other assets, meaning all other ones that are not rated is 100%. Any questions on the standard weight? Now, I'm not going too much into details on some of this, uh, we actually have a full Basel, three, Basel framework class for three days. In that class, we actually put, we explain more. But because I just need to cover a couple of things and I have a couple of more minutes, I think I'll just jump over this. Any questions on this that you might want to ask? Can I flow? Because I need to actually flow. 
I, I think because of our time, I won't want to do that example. Can I flow to the IRB? Please flow. Okay, wonderful. So let's let's now go to the IRB. Remember, I said there are two ways you can calculate your credit risk, risk weighted assets. The second one is the IRB, internal risk based, whether foundation or advanced. Now let's talk about the IRB. Now, when you are calculating using IRB, at that point you are saying, I am using applicable internal risk parameters to determine the risk in the business. And what are what are these? And what risk am I talking about? Credit risk. Now, there are three major things that talk about credit risk when it comes to risk parameters. One, probability of default. Probability of default measures the probability that the counterparty will fail, i.e., that the counterparty will default. The probability that Mr. A that took a 10 million loan and is supposed to pay tomorrow will not pay tomorrow. Two, the loss given default. Loss given default measures the loss in the time value of money as a result of the fact that Mr. A is supposed to pay his loan tomorrow. However, he did not pay tomorrow. He paid two days after or one day after. The loss in the time value of money as a result of the fact of the timing of the payment of Mr. A is what loss given default measures. And the third parameter used in measuring credit risk is exposure at default. And the reason why exposure at default is more encompassing is because some of those exposure at default is some of them are on balance sheets and some of them are also off balance sheet. No, no, okay. 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 I want everybody to tell me I'm the one delaying his call. Okay. Okay. So that is. Let me try to mute. Okay, taking it a step further. So that is actually some of those parameters that is used in determining the IRB. Now, if I go into the IRB a little bit, let's go into the IRB a little bit. Now, when you want to use the IRB, you must actually fulfill the minimum requirement. One of the minimum requirements you must have communicated with your, with your regulator. So communicated your framework with your regulator. You will discover that CBN was asking for some of this at a point in time. You must comply with those minimum requirements. They've given you some guidelines. There must be an internal rating system to determine whether Mr. A. Now, I'm going to explain this a little bit. But don't worry, you will be coming for the full three-day class. You will now see how it is built from scratch to real figure. But you see, there must be a rating system designed. Now, what we do in reality is that it is the credit risk rating within a credit score card that is used to determine the probability of default of an obligo. And there must also be a corporate governance structure. Now, I'm not going to bore you too much. I show, I'm showing the formula. But you see, this formula is very simple. Now, what does that mean? All I'm trying to say, in essence, is that you must have determined, so to determine the risk weighted assets for credit risk. Say, for example, for corporate uh, sovereign and bank exposures, it is K times 12.5 times the exposure at default. But you see, that K is a factor that determines the risk the credit risk that is unexpected. So there are two measures of your credit risk. The first one is expected credit loss. The second one is unexpected credit loss. So when you are actually doing accounting and you are doing IFRS 9, IFRS 9 only looks at the expected credit loss. But you see, there's a part of the credit risk that is not measured by that expected credit loss model. And that part is the unexpected credit loss. And that is what this K is. So K here measures the unexpected credit risk in a portfolio. Now, to put that into more perspective, I'm going to just open. We actually have all of these tools, really. We have all these tools, so it's just for you to plug in the number. Let me just go to this one for um, credit risk for single IRB. So for example, 
you need to have determined what the probability of default is. To determine probability of default, let me even try to explain that before I actually come to this. To determine probability of default, you need to actually, we have a framework to design for you. For example, we move from internal credit risk coming scorecard to what we have as probability of default. Now, for example, let's assume that you actually have a credit risk scoring framework in the office or in the bank that says we want to give, eh, please, I want to confirm that I'm not talking to myself because I think I'm talking alone. Please tell me that you're listening to me. Yes, we are listening. Yes, we are with, we are with you. Okay. We are with you, we are with you. Wonderful. So you see, to design a framework that will capture your IRB probability of default, it, we use this approach. The synthetic is that we have done for many banks. Here. So we use this approach. What is the approach? The idea is that for prob to determine whether Mr. A obligo will default is a function of his credit attributes. If it's a function of his credit attributes, let me type a little bit so that you will understand me. I say probability of default is a function of the credit attributes of the customer. Now, the question is now, that credit attributes of the customer, what are they? When I'm actually talking about the credit attributes of the customer, there are some of those things that inside the CBN requirement, some of them, they call them eligibility requirements. And some of them, you also have them. For example, let's look at those credit attributes. For example, you, what do you check out for when you want to give a loan out? What, what I'm talking about here is the credit attributes, effectively. What, you, what do you check out for when you want to give a loan? Let's talk about a simple framework. Please tell me, what do you check out for? For example, you want to give a loan to a look at it. You said? You look at the collateral of the... Collateral. Uh, what, yeah. do you, what do you check out for? The, you also look at the, the, the uh, worth uh, of the business. Cash flow. Cash flow. Right. Mm. What, what again? What know. of the business? I believe what of the business that you are saying is like the LPO or whatever they want to use it for. Yeah. What again? The character of the customer. And also, how do you determine character? You know that one is very, very. Uh, so what? what so are you maybe for that possibly one? from the past record of the. Oh, yeah. the so point, it is yeah. history, history of other other um, credits that they are taking from you. Abi, any other one? Because if you are talking about character, you can have bad, bad character from home, or you will still give him money. <laughs> I, mean, you know, I want you to explain yourself. Any other one that you look at for? What again do you look out for? If it's, if, it's, if it's an existing business, you may need to the historical bank uh, information. Okay, so when you are, now I want, I want us to be very, very specific. When I give you a bank information, what are you looking for inside? You are looking at the, 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 the inflows and outflows. Oh, right. you, are part 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 you are looking at cash flow. That's what I want to do. Yeah? For banks, they you're looking at cash flow. Okay, let's assume that you're looking at other things like disposable income, um, um, uh, income, or any other ratios that you use in your business. All these things I just put, they are what they call credit attributes. Now, these credit attributes also include things like your, uh, what they call that, past due information. Am I right? Now, some, yeah, I think some of us need to, so some of these past, all, all this information that you have here, they are actually called credit attributes. These credit attributes eh, of your customers, because you have been giving out loan in a long time, we have discovered that default is a function of these credit attributes. Because you can check from your credit records and you will discover that Mr. A that did not give collateral, he defaulted. Mr. B that has small cash flow, he did not default. Mr. C that has good history of loan, he did not default. Mr. D that has, so there's a relationship. That relationship 
eh, is what you will model to now create what we call the Z. That Z is now what is used to calculate what we call the probability of default. So probability of default is exponential of Z divided by one minus the exponential of Z. That is the way we calculate the probability of default. This is called the Altman Z. Now, when we have calculated the probability of default, like I said, uh, you will come for the full class, really, because I think I've spent my one hour. So that particular default that I've calculated here is what I'm actually calculating called probability of default point in time. When I have calculated probability of default point in time, now that probability of default point in time that I've calculated is what I am going to come and use inside this formula. This is the formula given by Basel to calculate the risk weighted asset on credit risk. And inside this formula, you will see LGD, you will see PD. So you must have calculated the PD per portfolio, LGD per portfolio, before you can now come and calculate the risk weighted credit, uh, credit risk weighted assets. Now, to now put that, after calculating my PD and LGD, which I will calculate for you in the full class, I will now come here, please just watch. This particular model that I actually have here, you only need to plug in the figures. For example, what is the probability of default is 20%. What is the loss given default is 40%. How much is the total exposure is 40 million. This tells you immediately how much the risk weighted asset is. It tells you immediately how much the risk weighted asset is, and it also tells you how much the total unexpected loss is. It tells us the total unexpected loss, which is what you actually have here. Please, can you see it in my calculation? Hello? Uh -huh. Yes, yes, yes. Sir, we can see it. So if you look at it, if I vary this thing, and I say the probability of default is now very high, that guy can default. And the loss given default is very high. That guy can default. Come and see what happens to the unexpected loss. You will discover that the unexpected loss and the total capital retirement is now 2.7 million. The higher the risk, and this actually helps us. Don't worry, in the full class, more explanation of the calculation of this. But this particular template, which will be given to everybody, and you can just plug in the numbers. And with that, you can calculate your credit risk weighted assets. Now, this particular one that I gave you is only for corporate, sovereign, and bank exposures. So if, for example, I can show you one where it is longer like this, and I can calculate the credit risk weighted asset for all of the exposure I have, I will just come here and I will just tell the application that the type of the exposure is either corporate or is either financial and it will continue calculating it for me. And it will also stress it and tell me the stressed position when I'm calculating it. So basically, that is actually what I'm doing when I'm calculating credit risk. With an asset. The whole idea is that credit risk is actually factored into calculating the credit risk with an asset. So at the end of the class, I will give everybody these slides. But because of our time, the slides, how they calculate the LGD, the PD, it is all inside the slide. So I, I think I think so. That I don't. I, I don't. I'm actually just going to allow my colleague to actually uh, uh, to actually say something. Uh, my colleague Samuel is just going to say one thing now. Samuel. Samuel, please. Are we yeah. listening? Hello, are we listening, please? Is everybody listening, please? Yes, we are. Okay, so yeah, we are. I'll just allow my colleague because this is supposed to be a one hour class, but I want to actually round it up in less than, I've done one hour already. I'll round it up in less than 10 minutes because of our time. But I'll allow my colleague to actually just say something. Samuel, Okay, hello everyone, good afternoon. My name is Samuel, can you all hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. 
Okay, good afternoon. So um, uh, we actually have um, um, bus cell classes coming up. That's the full class um, that my colleague Shemu has been talking about. So for bus cell uh, um, master class workshop, I think the first stream is coming up um, at the end of this month, 28th to 30th of this month. So it's actually a three day class. It's a three day class. And um, the first stream is physical. So it's a physical class um, at our training facility here at Ikeja, number 76, Mobile Logic Bank, Anthony Way, Ikeja. So it's a physical class that will hold between the 28th to 30th of um, June. So the virtual class for the Basel. The virtual class for the Basel will hold in July, as you can see on your screen, July 19th to 21. is also a three-day class. Um, we'll hold it virtually like this, as we're having this one now. So um, it's on um, July 19th to 21. Also, we have the stress test, um, stress test and workshop. The first stream, which is physical as well, will hold July 13th and 14th. July 13th and 14th, while the stream two, which is um, the... The virtual will hold in August, August 20th and 21. So any of these um, um, workshops um, that you feel you are interested in, just um, kindly um, 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 notify us by typing in the chat box. Just go to your chat box and type. If you are interested in the um, Basel physical class, just go there, type Basel physical class with your email address. So you type Basel physical with your email address. If it is virtual, just type Basel virtual with your email address and um, we'll reach out to you on the details of that particular workshop. Same thing goes for the stress test. So if you want the stress test physical, just type stress test physical, including your email address and or stress test um, virtual, including your email address. And um, we'll be happy to reach out to you and give you the details of, of this these workshops. Thank you very much. So uh, at this point, I'll just um, want to pass the mic back to my colleague to continue the class. Thank you very okay, much. Thank you very much. Sincerely, I would have preferred Basel class spiritual. I thought that the, <laughs> the opposite of spiritual is physical and spiritual. I wonder why it's virtual. Please, sir, can I get somebody that wants to come for a spiritual class? I, I want Basel, Basel class spiritual. Eh? This is, I, I, okay, I think I always see something on uh, what do you call it? I see something on uh, DSTV, there's a particular Indian film. I think the guy, he would just write the formula on the board and it will enter the head of, this, of the pupils. He would just write the formula and the head, it will begin to enter the head of the people. I think that one is far better. Eh? That is the, if you want to come for Virg, uh, what do you call it? Basel Spiritual. Please type Basel Spiritual. That one, you will not need to look too much. It will just enter your head. <laughs> okay, just on the line. I know. Now, this is actually a, a free, a free class, just a one hour class. I've done more than one hour, but let me just try to wrap up because I've only talked about credit risk and I did not go into detail. I want to tell you the truth. I didn't go into any detail. I just showed you something. Market risk is another one that we look at. There are two approaches also to calculating the risk quoted assets on the market risk. You have the standardized and you have the internal approach, internal um, uh, risk-based approach. Now, the standardized approach too, Basel has given us some leeway. However, that thing is a little bit complicated, I need to explain to you. Why? Because when you are calculating it, you need to calculate. I'm, I'm talking, for example, now on the market risk in terms of interest rate. Because when you're looking at the market risk, you're looking at interest rate risk, Equity risk, foreign exchange risk, commodity risk, option price risk, if you are doing such. Now, if I'm looking at just interest rate risk, I will still need to compute what they call specific risk and general risk. Now, I will just show you a simple template. Now, when you are coming for the full class, all of these templates, you have them really. It's not all these templates, you actually have them. You just need to plug numbers into them. And I think you don't need to stress yourself. So if I was coming and I'm looking for... What's the name of the one? Market risk standard. This is market risk standard. So as I put the instrument inside, this particular thing will actually give us the specific risk, general risk. And when you're looking at general risk, remember, you also have vertical disallowance, horizontal disallowance, offset within those disallowance. Why? Because within an instrument where we actually have long and short positions, 
And those long and short position actually has different issuers with different length of time. There's always what they call a basis risk. And because of that, we have the vertical disallowance to clear out the frictions or variability within the risk of the different interest rate in that basis risk. So that is what that actually computes. Now, the sincere truth is that I actually have more I want to share with us, but I was told I should actually do one hour. I want to just ask, is there any question on anything I've said as of now? Any questions at all on anything we have actually done? Hello, sir. Fire. I want not at all. <laughs> my name is Kari Abidini, and okay. my question is this. In some instance, in the process of computing ECA, SS credit loss, if the company is just putting up, like, say, they are in cooperation for one or two years, we used to make use of inflation rate and gross domestic products. But in the case we have negative GDP, Yes. Negative GDP. Yeah. How are you going to go about that? Okay. So you see this template I just showed you for this stress test. Yes, sir. Let me just show you this template. This template yes, is actually using the macroeconomics for the future. So if I scroll this thing up, you will see the macroeconomics. GDP, inflation, unemployment, oil prices. If you open the CBN framework around this, it actually give us some things that we should use. Now, when you are using all of those frameworks and you are projecting the future, what is going on is that it is creating a, a linear regression table. It is using that change to determine the relationship in historic data so that it can project future data. So in a situation where you have negative GDP, what it will be using to actually do that is to say, because you have negative GDP and you still add a probability of default of 0.2, in a year where you have positive GDP, did it reduce the probability of default? It will create a linear line. Yeah, that is what that thing is doing. So even if you have a negative GDP, by clicking on any of these things here, when I click on calculate projected regulatory capital or calculate all of these things, it will do logistic regression for me. And I will be able to know what it will be. So but what it's doing is that it is creating a linear line for regression and using the linear line to extrapolate future. So even if there's a negative GDP, it would have come out as a line. So it will still not make the PD to become negative. Have I answered your question, sir? I don't know whether I have. Yes, sir. Thank you. You're welcome, Thank you, sir. sir. OK. Thank you very much. At this point, I want to actually wrap it up. In all sincerity, we, are, we welcome any questions you might have. If you actually want us to come and um, I think I still had a training for stress testing for one of the groups. I think it was coronation group. I think I had for I like 74 people in the class for stress test, I think last month or last two months. So if you want us to actually have whether it's Basel class or stress testing class or any other kind of very complex classes like that for your own company alone, please let us know. I will just put my phone number here if you actually want to say hi to me. Do you need my phone number, sir? Because I don't like to be forward. Should I type it or you don't need it? We need it. Okay, so if you actually want to reach out to me, my phone number is 0. zero what's my phone number? 0 or zero eight zero six zero one two six nine seven two. My email address is this and you can also send it to this please i'll be willing to answer any questions you might actually have um we're only having fun together any questions i'm sorry that it can only be for one hour 15 minutes probably i would have loved it to at least plan for three days so please Join me when we actually have the physical class and the virtual classes, you will learn. That one I can tell you, and you will be able to do it yourself. Thank you very much. Um, any final words from anybody? Because me, I've said my own. Now, you should do both of thanks now. <laughs>
Hello, say something so that I know you are there. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, Thank, you Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Enjoy the Thank lecture. You. Thank, you very much. Thank, Thank you very much. We appreciate it. We'll see you at the uh, slide. Okay. So we'll send you. Thank you. We will send you the slides, and we'll also send you the video. We'll send you a link to the slide to the video, and we'll also send you the slides. You will see more information. They will send it today. They will send you all those information today, and we would like to see you at the at the full class. Thank you very much, and nice nice seeing you here. Uh, thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you very much. much. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you, Thank you very much. We appreciate you. Appreciate you. However, I did not see any spiritual class here. You people don't like spiritual. <laughs> uh, if somebody types your name and your phone number as spiritual. <laughs> okay, bye bye. <laughs> okay, bye. Okay.